Happy Mother's Day. And I, I, how many mothers feel like it's a little tough to be a mother right now in this time? I mean, let's just be honest. Cooking, cleaning, everything, right? This, this has been a little tough the last six weeks. Uh, I also want to recognize those who are not mothers, but, but household leaders right now, so to speak. Uh, maybe God hasn't blessed you with children, but you also have a lot of responsibility and duty, so we want to thank you for what you do. And all you moms right now, I tell you, my encouragement to you is milk it. Milk it hard. Today is the day. I, uh, I asked Beck, what's for lunch? And she goes, I don't know. What's, what is for lunch? So uh, we'll try and take care of that today. But uh, this is your day. This is a special day. And uh, <clears throat> through this whole pandemic, my thoughts have been wild and, and they've been not, not wild, but just going sort of different directions. And, and I mean, I've thought of a lot of things because uh, you, I tend to read some of the articles and, and on Facebook and, and things like that. In fact, I was challenged yesterday to stop reading them by a younger man than me. And I may just honor him and do that. But some of the things that are going on, uh, we won't get into them too deep, but it had my mind thinking that, you know what? I mean, I'm, I'm 43 years old, and I look out across here. There's, there's a ton of you that are my age or within 5, 10 years of, of, of that. Uh, I've lived a good life, and I, I, I've had a great life. I've, I've done a lot of adventurous things. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've recovered from them. I've, there, there's just, I've got a beautiful wife. I've got beautiful kids. I lived a decent life, right? But my kids is what comes to my mind. As I think about it, like, will they even have the opportunities to do things like I did? So as anybody else think that way or am I by myself? All right, good. I'm not by myself. So these things have been going through my mind and our freedoms are the, 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 Freedoms we have, those things are rapidly changing. There's laws and things being passed all the time, and, and some of that stuff is being challenged. And so it got me to thinking, and, and I was like, man, if we get back on Mother's Day, if we happen to have church on Mother's Day, I know what I'm going to preach. And so I want you to take your Bibles, and here we are, it's Mother's Day. I want you to take your Bibles. I want you to go to Exodus chapter 1, Genesis, Exodus, just page to Genesis chapter 1. Uh, and then we'll get to it in a minute. But uh, the other thing that came to me, I thought about preaching about, and you guys all kind of, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about here. It was in Daniel chapter 3 where Nebuchadnezzar had built this huge idol. It was 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide. He had asked everybody to bow to it. And there was three guys that said, out of all the Hebrew people that were around there, three of them said they won't do it. And, and I figured if I opened the mic up after that, we might not get done here today. So... Y'all know what I'm talking about. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they decided not to bow to that. Uh, here we are. We're having church. So thank you for coming. Uh, mothers, uh, by the way, have a huge role to play uh, in the outcome of our children's lives. How many believe that? Say amen. amen. I believe it is. I know that the father is supposed to be the leader, but there's something about me telling Chloe what to do, and then it's something about mom telling Chloe what to do. She listens better when mom says it. I'm too hardcore, I'm too stern, and I don't mean to be, but that's just kind of how I am. I, you know, and so uh, moms have a higher influence on when it comes to certain things in the house. I'm going to read to you Exodus chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 8, and we're going to read all the way through Exodus chapter 2 uh, to verse, let's see. Nine, 10. So one, eight through chapter two, verse 10. That makes sense? We're going to read a little bit. And as I read this, what I want you to do is I want you to think about the parallels that you can find with the very modern day life that we're living now, because that's what I'm going to teach this morning. I'm going to try attempt to teach about uh, the parallels of what this story is and what we're living in today. Does that make sense? By the way, does anybody know who Amram was? Not Phil, not Furman. Anybody else? 
Okay. Uh, d- does anybody know who uh, Jochebed was? All right, cool. You're going to learn some new names today. And maybe, maybe just maybe you'll name your kids that. Um, Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. Everybody there say amen. amen. All right, here we go. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Now, if you remember back in Genesis when Joseph was taken into slavery, he had become sort of a ruler over in Egypt and he had put some plans in place and he had put some rules in place and standard of living in place. And here comes, what he, all he's saying here is, here comes his new king who gave no regard to what Joseph had put in place because we know Joseph was an upright man. He was a man of God, right? This guy comes in and don't give any regard to Joseph. That's all he's saying here. Verse nine, look, he said to his people, now keep in mind, We're going to run parallel with modern day. The Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if a war breaks out, we'll join our enemies. Fight against us and leave the country. Hmm. Verse 11. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pithom and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. Huh. Can't exterminate them. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites, verse 13, and they worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar, and with all kinds of work in the fields, and all their harsh labor... In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua. There's another two names you can name your kids. When you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. Why do you think that was? It'll tell us a little bit here. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Verse 18, then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let these little boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. I'm going to read that again. Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. Which obviously irritated Pharaoh. And and because the midwives feared God... He gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all the people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. So the first order didn't work. And we'll get into that in a little bit of how these two, how midwives or uh, the midwives they had sent out to these people. How could you take a baby from someone and kill it right out of the womb? If it was a boy, kill it. If it was a girl, let it live. Now we're in chapter two. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds in the bank of the Nile. His sister, anybody know her name? Miriam stood, uh, where am I? I lost it, sorry. Thank you. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter, which was the king, the princess of Egypt, went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. 
He was crying and she felt, felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister, Miriam, asked Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Smart little girl, wasn't it? She had a plan, but it didn't just happen. Yes, go, she answered, verse 8. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. In verse 9, Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby, nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Now I want to give you a little bit of a backdrop to who Amram and Jochebed were. Amram was the blood father of Moses. Jochebed was the blood mother of Moses. And uh, it, it says in, in Exodus chapter 6, verse 20, that Amram was a descendant of the tribe of Levi, and Jochebed was actually his father's sister. Don't judge it. I guess it was okay back then. Not really cool today, but that, that's back then, I guess that's, they didn't have many to choose from. I don't know, but it was his father's sister. Clearly, I want you to understand that having a baby in the time of Pharaoh had to be a huge, huge burden. Can you imagine the anxiousness that they had? A Hebrew woman that was expecting with child, what, if it was a boy, they had to kill it. If it was a girl, they could let it live. Could anybody in here do that? I'm just asking. Not a fun thing for these Hebrew women to be going through. I remember so well uh, this for ultrasounds. It was always, I'm the type of guy, I want my surprise now. I don't want to wait till then. And, and it was always fun to know what we were having. And Becky was more of the other way. She, she would have rather waited, but I, I wanted to know. How many are like that? They want to know, right? We've got ultrasounds. I mean, those aren't cheap, but hey, they're handy. We want to know what they are. And they didn't have ultrasounds back then. And so they had to wait full term. And then when, it was, when they were born, they would decide what they needed to do. So they didn't know the outcome. And I'm sure it was a very anxious time for uh, Jochebed to be there. It, it imagine what she was doing every time that, that she would think about delivering this child. Uh, she also didn't know what she was carrying. But imagine what those women went through. And here's Jochebed. She's at home every day. Obviously, they weren't making the expecting women work. And, but their husbands were in slavery. All of the men and the boys were in slavery. That's part of the reason that Pharaoh wanted the boys to stay alive because he needed labor force. He knew that they could work harder and were more uh, beneficial in the work field than what the ladies were. So, hey, we'll just kill. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I had that backwards. We'll kill all the boys. But the, the, the main reason that he was doing that is for the army. He was scared that they would rise up and, and come after him and, and take over. So here was Amron, the dad. He's out in the field every day, and the responsibility of hiding this baby came down to mom. What's she going to do with him? Josephus is a Jewish historian. He says it this way. He believed that Amran had received actually a vision from God stating that God was going to deliver the children of Israel through his lineage. Pharaoh's astrologist, according to Josephus, also said that, that his astrologist told Pharaoh the very same thing. So Pharaoh knew that there was this, this chance that this boy would be raised and it would rise up and deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. Pharaoh didn't want that. That's why all the babies had to be killed. The baby boys had to be killed. And a lot of times, if you know your scripture, Moses is a lot of times paralleled right with Jesus because Jesus was actually prophesied as a, the birth. Remember that? They would come to Joseph and Mary. The angels came. And so this very same thing happened hundreds of years before Jesus. And I believe Jochebed. Can anybody say Jochebed? Let's say it together. Jochebed. Jochebed. Not bad. I believe she sets an example, and I think today we're going to study 
that she sets a very good example of a godly woman living intentionally inside of the times that she was given to live. Her appearance in Scripture is very, very short. You don't read about her much. But in that little short time, she made a huge impact in a guy's life that would lead millions of people out of slavery and deliver them. What can we know? There's four things I want you to know about Jochebed. The first thing is she understood the times that she lived in. And that's what I want to challenge the ladies in the house today and the men. You men got to listen to. Understand the times that we're living in. This is different than it was for our parents. We, this is a different day that we're living in, and we need to know that we're raising our kids in a hostile culture. How many would agree with that this morning? See, Pharaoh's decree was to kill every boy. And I will tell you, it's not much different today. I don't think that Satan's strategy has changed much. I really don't. If you look at the abortion rate that we're going through in this country, and, and then if, if, if they do live, there's a huge, huge rate of that. They're killing babies by the millions. And then if they do live, look at the tactics that he's using to get into our kids' brains and into our kids' souls. And we stand on the sidelines so many times and just, let it go. See, Jochebed knew that he was going to kill all the baby boys. She also knew that it was a, by keeping this child that there was a huge risk. But she knew that if she would raise this child in the culture that, that, that he was getting born into, she would face a lot of things. So she had to make decisions. She had to make some plans. She had to be smart. She had to understand the times. And today doesn't look much different, I don't believe. I believe there's a, there's a decree that was been sent out to take the next generation out. And we have a job to do as parents, not just moms, dads. We have a job to do as parents. Satan's still trying to destroy us today. There was a death sentence placed on her child, and she knew that she was going to have to, if that child was going to live, she's going to have to do some things different. There was going to have to be a different thing happening because of the, whatever the mainstream norm, y'all know what was going on. I guarantee you with, with what, three million people and how many ladies having babies, how many were going down to the river every day to throw their babies into the river? She knew she was going to fight an uphill battle. This was not going to be easy, but she was up for it. And I'm trusting when the ladies leave here today, you guys are all up for it too. Uh, I just look and, and I see, I, like, I'm just in awe at some of the things that I see our kids watching and, and looking at and the games they play and, uh, or have the opportunity to play. We try not to let them play, but I, that's a death sentence. It's not edifying in any way. So what are we going to do? Jacob has said, I will rise up and I will protect my child. I read an article that alarmed me. And lawmakers are making and passing laws all the time that you and I don't even know. Did you know that my 14-year-old daughter by the law, if she were to get pregnant, she could go to school to the counselor, she could confide in the counselor, and they could orchestrate and organize an abortion for her without them contacting you. Did you know that? It actually starts at 12 years old. But if my son has a runny nose and he needs a Tylenol, they'll call and ask how many to give him. That's the day we're living in. That's crazy. That's bizarre to me. And we're trying to raise kids. And I mean, I, I, I just trust that we have done the right thing. 
I trust that we're doing the right thing. And there's no, nothing more that has, I mean, this whole pandemic thing and the crisis that we're going through has really got me to thinking like, have I trained my kids enough? My oldest is 19. He's, I, you know what? I can't teach him anything anymore. He's better than me in anything he does. <laughs> Calvary Bible School was a, a, uh, a beachy Bible school over in, where was Calvary? In Arkansas? Somebody help me out. Was that correct? There was a teacher there by the name of Menacoons. He was a good friend of my dad's. He was a preacher as well. He said in his teaching, if you give me a child from birth to six years old, you can place him after that. You can put him in any environment you want. And I guarantee you he'll live for God because I've done my job from zero to six. Zero to six. You have, you have a very little bit of time. So anyway, don't, don't regret some of the things you haven't done for those of you who have older kids. Here she is. She don't care about what the king, king said. She didn't care about what was popular. Pharaoh said to throw the babies into the Nile. It reminds me of, hey, we can't have church for six weeks. Pharaoh said, throw, throw the babies into the Nile. And everybody was walking down to the Nile and doing that. That had a baby boy, but not her. What do we do when our kids come and say, hey, well, other kids are doing it. This is the popular thing to do. They're playing Fortnite. Huh. Have you parents heard that one? Or am I the only one? Oh, y'all got to talk more with me. I'm alone up here. So Amran and Jochebed, they knew they were risking their lives by keeping this baby alive. And they knew that breaking the law, so to speak, or going against what, the, what King Pharaoh had said was going to be a challenge. But they knew that that baby's life was in the balance. And it's the same way that our kids' lives are in the balance today, I believe. And if we don't stand up to this culture, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? You know, if they came in, I'm 43 years old, I'll finish what I had started with. I've lived a good life and I know I have faith and I believe that God's grace would cover my life to the point that if they asked me, which no one has, but if they came to the point where they would ask me to denounce my faith, I believe that I can say with certainty to all of you here, I would not do that. I would stand for Christ. But I was taught, I was raised in a very good Christian home. I was taught some very good morals and some very good things, ethical things and scriptural things. And I believe I could stand for what I believe. And you say, well, Jimmy, you're way off and left. Yeah, you're way off. No, we're not that far away from it. If you stop and look from some of the things that are happening, they're coming into place. But what about my kids? What about my kid? What about your kids? Would they stand and pronounce Jesus Christ as their Savior? That's why I'm so passionate about it. That's why I'm passionate about Awana. That's why I'm passionate about Bible school, vacation Bible school, which I'm not sure where we're going to be on that one coming up this summer. But that's why I'm passionate about the preschool here, laying down foundations for our kids. That's why I'm passionate about kids' church. Making, giving them something that they can take with them for the rest of their lives. Because I remember going to kids' church, or it wasn't called kids' church. We were at Sunday school. That Sunday school, we had those big felt boards. Remember those felt boards with the little characters you stick up? Oh, I learned so much from that. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, the one felt story was Pharaoh's daughter with the basket with Moses in it. And you say, well, thank you for doing that, Jimmy, but I'm here to tell you the church is not responsible for your kids' soul. It starts at home. It starts at home. What you're teaching them at home. We have to learn to sacrifice. We have to learn to say no to some things. And even though it seems mean sometimes, we have to be able to tell them, no, that's not going to be watched in my home. That's not going to be listened to in my home because we're losing when we turn the TV on, it looks like we're losing a cultural war. It looks like sin's winning, doesn't it? We have 
a job to do. And then when we see that, we back up and we retreat. I'll be honest with you, this whole pandemic had me a little backed up. Because the last thing I like to do is preach to a camera. And, and I, was, I was fearful of it, to be honest with you. I hated it. And so uh, it's good to see faces. So chapter, chapter 1, verse 19 Go back to that. And the midwives answered Pharaoh. Pharaoh sees the kids running around. He had ordered a decree that all the boys be killed. And, he had, and here he's seeing all these kids running around, these little boys, and he's asking the midwives, what's up? Why did you not follow my orders? And they're telling him this. Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. And that's another thing. They weren't the same. So Hebrew women not like Egyptian women. Is there a difference in our parenting? Because there was a, a visual difference between those two types of women. And I think for you women out there, is, is, is there a difference in the way that you're raising your kids? Or is it the same way that the people in the world are raising their kids? We have a job to do. We have a duty. And our kids, just because we come to church every week, we bring them to church every week, doesn't mean that things change at home. There ought to be a difference. There ought to be certain places our kids can't go, certain shows and movies they can't watch. But is there? We can't blend in. So Jochebed, she understood the times, and she had to do something different. The second thing that Jochebed did that I want you to write down, just write it down. Jochebed knew her limitations. She understood her limitations. She understood the times. She understood her limitations. Exodus chapter 2. Now go to verse 3. Here's what I'm talking about. When she could hide him no longer, she understood her limitations. She got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch, and she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds. She knew that she wasn't going to be able to keep that baby quiet any longer. I mean, some of us think that we'll just build a basket big enough to keep an 18-year-old in and we'll just protect him the whole time. She knew her limitations. He was three months old. She knew she had him for that long. Now, I believe she had a plan that Miriam would be, I think they were watching when Pharaoh's daughter would come down to bathe. I think they knew that schedule fairly well. I, I believe that with my whole heart and I believe it was a, a, a plan attack on Pharaoh's daughter for Miriam to come up and say, hey, I know a woman who, can I, shall I go get you a woman that, that could nurse this child? But she knew that for these three, if that don't work out, she needed to do something with the time that she had. And she knew the limits was about three months. She could no longer hide him. And she knew she had done all that she could do up to that point. She knew that if she wanted to save her son, that she was going to have to do something different again. Us as parents, we need to know our limitations. Sometimes we need to change our strategy in our training in order to save our children. I, Becky says this a lot, and, and I would agree with her. We had Damon and we had Chloe, perfect parents give or take a few. The third one came. All those plans out the door. Not one of them worked. We're still working on it. Love him to death. Wouldn't take a million for him. Wouldn't give a nickel for another one like him. <laughs> we have to change our plans. We have to. They, they, what, what worked for Damon does not work for him. Not even close. It's, it's polar opposite. Does that make him a bad child? Not at all. It makes me look like a bad parent, but I better study how to change. And when he's five years old, it changes again. And when it's 10 years old, it changes again. And we got to learn to change. It can't just stick to the same thing that, that the way we were raised doesn't work. And so when it says in Ephesians, Father, provoke not your children to wrath, I think sometimes the way that we provoke them to wrath is that we're not willing to change our strategy in our training. We have to change. You have to do some things differently as they grow up. You have to do things differently as the culture changes around you. But the one thing that you can do is stay true 
to God and true to his word. Every child is different. Every age is different. You got to know your limitations, be able to shift gears. Jochebel knew her limitations. She also knew that she couldn't always shield her child. Hence, a bigger basket. She also knew that they were coming. And the Egyptian people were coming. Pharaoh's men were coming. And if they would find that baby, they would throw him into the Nile. The analogy that I want you to think about is if they come and they throw him into the Nile. He's going into the Nile either way. You understand what I'm trying to say? He's going to get into life either way. He's going to join mainstream life either way. You have a choice. You can let him be thrown in and see if he can swim, or you can place him in a basket in a protected environment. You can do your part, everything that you can do at home while you have him, in the time that you have him. That Nile was dangerous. It's got snakes in it. It's got, I was raised on a river. It wasn't the Nile River, but uh, we had gators and snakes and uh, you name it. And uh, there's nothing better than to go down there and float down with an inner tube. It's sort of like floating through an aquarium. There's snakes everywhere. Glenn, you like that? You ready to go? We just did that last summer. And it was amazing how many different reptiles you saw. It it's literally is like going through one of those little things. But that's why she was placing him. The, the current was going to be tough. There's all kinds of dangerous animals out there. And so we have to do the same as, a, as parents. We have to do our part in training and releasing and trusting them to God. So number one, she understood the times. Number two, she knew her limitations. Number three... She was a mother who trusted God and acted out her faith. When she heard Pharaoh's decree, she didn't sit and cry about it and go into depression. She didn't curl up on the couch and watch TV all day. She was a woman of action. She got things done. She had a plan. She came up with a plan, and I think the whole family was in on that plan. She said, I have to do something. A woman of action. I believe Miriam's bravery, they say she was 12 years old. I believe Miriam's bravery from watching her mom. That didn't just happen. She was like, to walk up to Pharaoh's daughter and say, hey, can I go find one, a woman to nurse this child? That took grit. That took courage. She didn't just have that on her own. No, her mom, it was a result of Jochebed's faith and bravery. Most of the 12-year-olds in this room, what would they do? If they'd have been down at the river and they just saw Pharaoh's people go over, the daughter go over and get that basket, what would have they done? Run home. Mom! They took the baby. Or would have they done the same thing? I'm just asking. It's all in how we train them. So she had seen her mom working in faith, and she stood up, and she was bold, and she was confident. It even bled into Moses. And, and you know, we'll get to the part of that later, but Moses He's written about in Hebrews, and it says there that by faith, he left Egypt. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. Would you not say that the small amount of time that she had Moses, she could instill that type of faith? He's about seven years old when she took him back. We'll, re we'll, we'll get to that. He had also seen her faith. What are our kids seeing in us? I'm talking to myself. I'm, believe me. We don't have it all together. I don't. The other half does. We have to walk uprightly before God and let our, we need to let our children see God in us. You're responsible to teach them. 
Jochebed acted on her faith. She did her part first before she trusted God. I think sometimes we get lazy, and I know I have, and I'm like, well, you know what? He, our kids are in a good school. Our kids are in a good church. They're in a good community. I don't have to be as intentional. But we're called to be intentional with our kids. Fourth thing, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. She redeemed the time. I can't imagine how intentional, and I'm talking about the time that she had when she laid that basket in the river. Pharaoh's daughter comes and gets the basket. Miriam says, can I go find somebody to nurse the child? Sure. When she gets that, and it happened to be Moses' mom, it happened to be her again, because Miriam had a plan. They had planned this all out. Jochebed gets that child for the second time. Can you imagine the intentionality behind her life for as long as she had? Plus, she's getting paid to do this. Pharaoh's daughter had no idea. We have just a little bit of time with our kids. We, the, the, the blip on the map is very, very small on the timeline of life. Let's make the most of it. Hebrews chapter 11 uh, in 24, I was talking about how Moses by faith left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He, he, it also says in verse 24 that he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Why? Because his mom had instilled in him who he is. Before he ever left, he knew who he was. He had a true identity of who he was. He was a Hebrew. He was one of them, and he was coming back. So what are we doing to redeem the time that we have? Would you guys stand? Now more than ever, I believe there is a decree sent out from Satan himself against our people. It's becoming more and more evident. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 on, it says that we are to write these scriptures on the road when we're walking. It says that we're, when we go to bed to our kids, it's talking about our kids, when we wake up, we are to tie them on our hands. We're to put them on our doorposts. What's he saying? We, as, as parents, have the, have the privilege and we have the responsibility to teach our kids. And it's not, it's, it's all the time. We need to be doing this all the time. Take every opportunity to teach the word of God. Redeem the time. These kids need us. We can learn so much from Jochebed. Everybody say Jochebed. You got it. Exodus chapter 1 and chapter 2. She was a godly woman. She understood the time she was living in. She knew her limitations. She acted on her faith and she redeemed the time. I know I can do so much better. Let's raise a generation that can stand up to the things that are coming. And I'm not a doomsday prophet on any stretch of the imagination because I know that God will win. We will win as Christians. We will overcome. It doesn't matter what comes our way. We need to raise a generation who knows who they are in Christ the same way that Moses did. You never know. Your kid might be the next one to deliver millions from bondage. I don't know what God has for you, kids. I don't know. All I know is mothers have a special place. And I had to think, Miriam, the daughter, special place in history. Bold, courageous. I had to think, Pharaoh's daughter, compassionate. Motherly instinct didn't even have a connection to this kid. 
thought it would be wise to spare his life. Unbelievable change of history through that. God bless all you ladies today. Thanks for being here. Um, we have a special gift for you, and I'm going to let Lexi explain it to you. We have a special gift for every lady in the house today uh, that is responsible for a family to feed. Cool? So God bless you guys. Yeah.